Thank you, Lord. Can we just lift up our hands and just worship the Lord for a moment? Lord, we want you to have your way this afternoon. We want you to speak to us. We want to hear from you. We want to hear by the Spirit. We want to be in agreement, Lord, with everything that you would say to us today. We want to be open. We want to be open. Give us ears to hear. Give us a heart of understanding today. We ask you expressly right now that you would give us a word. Give us a word. Speak to our hearts today, Father. Thank you that the word of the Lord brings to us today those things that we have need of. And so with a heart of expectation right now, Lord, we enter this holy time of your word as we break this bread, as we receive this bread, this, this manna, this, this living word. We give reverence to your word today, your word that is alive, your word that is truth. We honor you, God. We honor the word of the Lord today in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Sunday school kids can make their way out today. This Sunday I want to continue in the next part of the series that I've been preaching on, Living a Jesus First Lifestyle. I'm going to put a subtitle again on it today, this tag, and I want to minister about alignment today. Someone say alignment. Alignment. I really believe that this series, though it might be a challenging series, it is very rich and will bring change to your life if you can allow the message to speak and resonate within your heart and within your mind. If you can open up your heart to hear and receive what the Lord is speaking to you through his word, it will bring great impact in your life. Because I know that if you begin to live a Jesus first lifestyle, you will experience change and you will experience transformation that, that will leave you in a place of awe, that will leave you in a place of thankfulness where you're giving God the glory for the changes that have come into your life. God wants to do good things in your life. God wants to bring good change in your life. It's hard when God begins to work in us sometimes or begins to change us. It's not always comfortable as He brings us to the process of change, leading us to transformation. Many times we experience growing pains, frustrations, Struggling to understand what it is that is taking place. But through it all, keep on trusting in the Lord. Because as He works in you and as He changes you, there is reward on the other side. That though change might not always be easy or always be comfortable, understand that it, it is always good. It is always good that the work that God does in you is a good work. Some would say it's a good work. This is where we have to trust that our Father has our, our, our best interests at mind. Even at times where our interests don't align with His. Where our desires might not align with His. And so this is why sometimes we find the friction. Or why sometimes we find the struggle. Because our desire is over here, but God's desire is over there. And He's trying to shift us to the place where we come into agreement and alignment with what He is saying over our lives and what is His will. Living a Jesus first lifestyle. I want to just ask you to be completely raw and honest with yourself for a moment today. Let down some of your guards and some of your walls. And just ask yourself honestly and say, am I living a Jesus first lifestyle? And don't just look at those places where you know you are. <laughs> but let him speak into those places where you know there's struggle. And you know there's resistance. And you know there's hesitations to give up. Some of the things that God is calling you to give up and to let go of. But God wants to show himself 
in our lives, through our lives. He wants to do a full work and a complete work for His glory. For His glory. It's Christ Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Amen. And the Bible has said that we are the salt and the light in the earth. That Jesus wants to shine through us. And so the church has got to transition to the place where we are in alignment with Jesus. Coming to that place of abandonment. Willing to let go. Because we want to gain Him. More than anything else that is trying to captivate our lusts, our eyes, our desires, our ears, or our interests. Give God first your time. Give God first your finances. Give God first your family. Give God first your relationship. Give God first your goals. Give God first your dreams. Give God first your desires. Now, if you only hear me today religiously, this sounds to you impossible. Or like an undertaking that is just too big for you. Or maybe it just sounds to you like an impractical list and just another place where you have to perform and you've got to perform better perform better but he is not telling you today just to perform better he is showing you that there is grace that if you will allow grace to work in all areas of your life the blessing of the lord will abound and you will see transformation you see many of times it's our own mindsets that we're stumbling over because we think it's all about a list of requirements and just about do's and don'ts and we don't recognize that he is calling us into the fullness of relationship where he is showing us the path of life amen where the law was do's and don'ts in the New Testament, we've come into relationship so intimately that Jesus lives on the inside of us and has written his word in our hearts. So we're not just living by performance, but we're living out of the relationship that is on the inside of us or what we share with him now. So I'm not just striving in my flesh, trying to perform or trying to do better. No, he lives on the inside of me now. I'm in sweet relationship with Jesus and now he is conforming me to his image. Because I am in relationship with him, he is teaching me how to be like him. Christ living through me, Christ on the inside, making a change in my life. This is not to say that there should not be a strong sense within us of what is right or wrong. But where in those places we only hear that I've got to do better and you don't recognize the work of grace that accompanies. You see, God is looking for your repentance. God is looking for your honesty where you can recognize places where maybe you've been disobedient, you've held back, and God is calling you to let some of those things go. Be honest with the Lord. Someone say, be honest. For some folks, that's a real hard thing to do. Be, be, because they're used to looking for an escape route. And so they'll take an escape route. And they won't be honest with somebody. And they won't be honest with themselves. And they won't be honest with God. Because there is times, even within ourselves, that it's a struggle to really be honest. And so God is telling us to let something go. And we don't want to let it go. So we start lashing out at people. Well, it's their fault, and it's his, and this, and all of that. But, but then we come back, hopefully we come back to that place where we can be honest and recognize, no, it, 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 those things might have a little place somewhere, maybe. But what is really going on is God wants to change my heart. God wants to work in me. God is calling me to let go. He's calling me and teaching me how that I can live a Jesus first lifestyle. He wants to get involved in my time. He wants to get involved in my finances. He wants to show me how when I honor him and I bring my tithe to him and my offerings to him, what he will do in my life as I respond to him in that kind of faith and with a heart of giving that my heart is in my giving 
Not just giving religiously. Not just giving grudgingly, hello somebody, or of necessity, but where your heart is in your giving and you give as unto the Lord. You recognize that the tithe that you bring, the offering that you bring, you give it to the Lord. But let me tell you today, this should come with trust and faith. And maybe for some of you, that's the struggle right now. It's hard to let it go because you, you, you think if I let go of it, I don't have enough. But this is a place of trust where we have to learn to lean on him and recognize as I honor him and as I bring him first, I trust and lean on him to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That there is resources of heaven, and I serve the king of the kingdom, that he has called me to operate in now, so that as I learn to operate in the principles of God's kingdom, I reap the benefits of such, where there is unlimited resources. It's easy for God. Now, I'm not preaching to you today something that I haven't lived or something that I haven't proven. And more so in these last three years than any other time probably in my life. Because I lived a life of faith when I, you know, I, some of you don't, might not know, but I was a full-time evangelist from the time I was like 20 and 21, 21 full-time. And so it was a life of faith. You're just dependent completely on whatever comes in in the next place you go, but, but not dependent on that really, but dependent on the Lord. And you watch how God will meet your needs. And when it gets tight, sometimes it would get tight, but then you watch how God would supply. Even in the last few years, because that was one thing when I was single and traveling, and, you know, I, I didn't have a, a, a whole lot of responsibility. I mean, I still had a, my own place and things like that, but I didn't have this huge overhead. When you have a family... You feel a little bit different. You think a little bit different. <laughs> and so in the last few years, I've never proved it any more than in these last few years where really God has proven himself to me is what I'm trying to say. In his faithfulness and his ability to keep, and even where we don't see how the need can be met, he meets the needs. Even where we don't see how we can get ahead, he gets us ahead. That even though there might be lack all around you, God is able to cause you to abound. Amen. There might be famine everywhere else and famine for others, but God is able to cause the blessing to flow over your life, over your family, over your business. See, this is where we've got to come to that place of trust and reliance. Someone say reliance. Reliance upon the Lord. Hallelujah. So let him work in your time. Let him work in your finances. Let him work in your family. I'm going to just pause for a minute. I'm going to read in 631 of the book of Matthew just because I've been trying to incorporate this verse into every message that we've been talking about this subject. And it says in Matthew 6 and 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? This is where fear will take us. This is where worry will take us. This is where anxiety will take us. And we will find ourselves thinking things like that then saying things like that. What are we going to eat? How are we going to pay this off? This debt is too big. How am I going to pay this off? I don't know how. I don't know how. How? How? And, and, and it's not just that you're sincerely asking a question so much that, that you're just speaking out of a place of fear. Hopelessness. Amen? Lots of times when we say how, we're not really asking a question. We're, we're, we're just reiterating the sense of hopelessness that we have on the inside. of I don't know how. Feels hopeless. Looks impossible. But he said, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. This is the way that people live lives that don't know God. But he's calling you to live a higher way. Because you know God. Because God is your father. Because you're a king's kid. And you're part of the kingdom of God now. He doesn't want you just to forget his kingdom and start operating in this earth like you're just a natural person. With no hold on the spiritual realm or the word of God. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We navigate this life, but we are to stay plugged into the spirit. 
Come on, somebody talk to me in here. This is good preaching. I don't know if you've realized that yet or not, but it's good preaching. After all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Does God really know the price of propane? <laughs> does God really know what gas prices have been? Yes, He does. He knows everything that you have need of. But He's calling you to lean and trust on Him to be your supply. As you navigate this life that you're leaning on the Lord and you're operating out of God's economy and not just man's. You can operate out of man's economy, but you'll find lack. You'll, you'll go like this in every recession and all of the other things. But there's something greater as a child of God that you can anchor to and operate in God's economy. Hallelujah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, he said. But seek ye first. Get this in your heart. Seek ye first. Seek ye first. This is living a Jesus first lifestyle. But seek ye first. First, so you, not just your pastor seeking it for you. No, you got to learn to seek first a Jesus lifestyle. Seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto us. You see, when we really have a heart that is in the place that God is, wants it to be, it's not just about us anymore. We're living beyond us. We're, we're, we're now part of the kingdom and we want to we wanna move in the kingdom. We want to be a blessing in the kingdom. God doesn't want to just bless me just so he can add numbers to me. He wants to bless me so that I can be a blessing. Amen? Hard to give what you don't have. But God wants to bless us that we can be a blessing in the earth and use us as a tool to send missionaries. To sustain churches, to build churches for his kingdom and for his glory. What is happening? It's the saints responding to the word of the Lord. And, and as a complete unit, we are doing things for his kingdom, things that the devil doesn't want to happen. The devil doesn't want those things to happen. But God's people binding together in unity, causing things to be able to come to fruition, expansion that would have never been done if the people didn't get the mind of Christ with God's kingdom in heart and head. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for the sweet silence that I sense in the house. Amos 3 and 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Amen. How easy is it to do life when you and your spouse are on completely different wavelengths? <laughs> How easy is it to walk together when you're divided? When you've been fighting all day? It's not so easy just to, hey babe, you want to go to the store? Want to catch a movie? What's for dinner? That stuff, not so easy when you're divided. How can two walk together except they be agreed? This is where the Lord wants us to come into alignment with Him. So it is God's Word that is the principal thing in our life. And it is being incorporated or funneled all the way down from we have put God number one. And from there it comes down second, third, fourth, everything else. But God is touching every area of our lives because he cares about every area of your life. He cares about your time. He cares about your finances. He cares about your family. He cares about your goals. He cares about your dreams. He cares about your desires. He cares about your business. You see, sometimes we get detached from this reality and we don't think that God really cares. But I'm telling you today that God really cares. He really does care. He really cares about your family. And he's fighting for your family at times when you've forgotten to. And you've neglected to. And you lost the fight. But he never stopped fighting. And so he's calling us as his people to come into agreement with him. 
We can look at this all the way back into the beginning of creation and the beginning of man, where God made man in his own image. It wasn't just some other image or some other foreign thing. It was his own image. That's the kind of identity that he placed on man. That's the kind of identity he placed on you. That's the kind of identity he placed on me. He made us in his own image. And then he's seen man. And said that it was not good for man to be alone. So he brought Eve out of man's rib. And God gave him a helpmeet. And so one became two. <laughs> but yet God is calling us to all to be one. Just the same as there's however many of us today. But God is calling us to be one. And so man and woman operating in the covenant of marriage, operating under God, man the head of the household, the wife there, a help mate, a help meet, but this is not in a domineering, controlling way, but God has given man strength and called him to be the chief servant. And this was illustrated in the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. For sometimes church folks want to get controlling and domineering and all of that, and it's not in a right spirit. It's not in a right spirit, I said. And they miss the message that was the leader of the church, the head of the church, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for the church. And so, yes, you're called to lead, but make sure you've got the heart of a servant. Make sure that you are in pursuit of God and that you are in alignment with Him. And so God made man and then He made family. And from the beginning, there was one man and one woman. And this was God's concept of the marriage from the beginning. It is still God's concept of the marriage today. From there, man had fallen and fell away from God. He became depraved, lost his place, which brought us to the Lamb of God and God's plan of salvation. That where man was far separated from God, with no way to come back into reconciliation, no way, no repentance, didn't matter. There was nothing that could bring them back into that alignment or to cause them to be righteous in right standing with God again but one supreme sacrifice where the blood of bulls and goats would only pacify for so long but the blood of the Lamb once offered, hallelujah, amen, forever received the blood of Jesus that has brought us redemption, the forgiveness of sins, and where we were so far from him, amen, he, he's broken down the middle wall of partition, and he's brought us back into him. Through the blood of Jesus, he brings us into righteousness. Amen? I'll say it again, you, you need to get this. Through the blood of Jesus, he brings us into righteousness. I'm righteous because I tithed on Sunday. No, you're not. Well, I'm righteous because I've been going to church my whole life. No, you're not. We're righteous because He's brought us into right standing with Him and it's through His finished works and His works alone. But from there, as He makes us to be the righteousness of God in Christ, He wants us to live out what we are. And so we find ourselves in the earth in a battle because we're surrounded by a culture that doesn't know God. We're, we're, we're surrounded by a system that doesn't include God. We're, we're, we're surrounded by so many different thoughts and so many different ideas that came from man who was fallen away from God and did not know God, but yet He has given us the Word of God that the, 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 the truth that, that, that keeps us and sets us straight, that, that is the rock that we can stand upon and that we can build upon, the rock of His Word. For heaven and earth shall pass away, but the Word of God will abide forever. 
We find ourselves in the struggle because we're surrounded by these things in the natural realm. And so our mind needs to be renewed to God's truth. So we are walking in the spiritual area. And from that it is flowing also through all areas of our life. And so it brought us to Jesus who came in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word was made manifest, manifest and it, it dwelt among us. And we have four beautiful Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That we have the teachings of Jesus. That we can live by the things that the Master taught. That the King of the Kingdom taught. That the Lord of Lords taught. It's not like we are here without instruction. Come on, church. I said, it's not like we are here without instruction. But He has given us His words. In most of your Bibles, they're probably found in those precious red letters. But it is the words of Jesus where He came and He spoke only those things that He heard of the Father. He spoke the mysteries of the kingdom. The carnal man could not understand it. But God is calling us as His children to come into alignment with the things of the kingdom, the mysteries of the kingdom. This doesn't come just by hearing the words of the preacher today, but by hearing the word of the Spirit also, so that you hear with revelation, and it comes alive on the inside of you, where by the Spirit of God, God gives you understanding. Because if you're just trying to live by what I say, you're likely to stumble all over it all over the place until it becomes real to you, and you realize that this is what God is saying to your heart. What he is speaking to you. And so we have the gospels of Jesus. And from there, where Jesus ascended on high, gave gifts unto men. He gave us the comforter, the Holy Ghost. Some would say the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. I've been saying it. I'm just going to keep on saying it. We need the Holy Ghost. I want it to sound in the airwaves in this room. I want it to sound over the airwaves online. I want it to ring in every ear, every ear that is open. That you would hear by the Spirit of God today. And you would also be able to confess. We need the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is so much more than just a good feeling. But I love the good feelings. So much more than just a jig, but I, I love to jig in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> we need the Holy Ghost. We need life in the side of us. We can't just be stiff-necked religious people. Amen. That, 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 are, that are like stubborn mules. All we do is criticize. All we do is frown. All, all we do is complain and, and lift ourselves up above one another. That's not what the work of the Spirit does in our life. For the work of the Spirit will help us be humble. The work of the Spirit will teach us to love. The work of the Spirit will bring us into unification. It will cause us to be uniters and not dividers in God's church and in the kingdom of God. Not to say that there is not times where you will have to take a stand and that it will not come with friction or that it will not be without friction or without opposition because there will be opposition in this life. And I've been using this verse and I want to bring it in again because it was when Jesus was, ha, had a tremendous following and a multitude of people that were with him and they were following him and they, and, and, and as he would go, they would go and as he would move, they would move and as he would stop, they would stop. He had a mega church. He had a tremendous following. And then he turns to them and says, if any man comes after me or comes to me, and does not hate his own, or does not hate his father, and his mother, and his wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, let's get this one also, and also his own life, or and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. 
He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You see, we live in a day where everybody just wants him to be Savior and nobody wants him to be Lord. But I want you to know today that he is Lord and Savior. And he is called Lord a lot more than he's called Savior. This doesn't take away from the fact that he is Savior and everything that that is and the beauty of that. But we must know him as not only Savior, but also the Lord of our lives and if you only want to claim him as savior but don't know him as lord you need to take a good look at your salvation because it should be questioned are you after god or are you living for yourself do you call him lord but do not hear or do not follow do not have a heart that is in pursuit or after the Lord. Now again I say to you, hear by the Spirit. Don't listen to the words of the devil as he tries to bring shame and condemnation into your life. I'm asking you, church, is your heart towards God? Do you have a desire to serve Him, to walk with Him, to know Him in holiness, to know Him in intimacy? Do you have a desire to allow Him to take you deeper Paul wanted to know him also in the fellowship of his sufferings not just in the mountaintops but also to know the Lord in the valleys and so it was when everybody was following him that he came with this strong word and said if you don't hate your father mother wife children brothers and sisters and even your own life you can't be my disciple now we know that he was not speaking of the kind of hate where you're bitter and, and, and ugly towards those in your life. A Jesus' first lifestyle is the very opposite of that. And where you've been ugly, <laughs> he teaches you how to be soft. Where you've been hard, he teaches, he softens your heart. Amen? He softens your heart. Where once maybe you would have just responded right away, anger, rage. He softens your heart. He softens your heart. He gives you a heart of wisdom. He gives you the heart of God and shows you how to navigate things. But what is he speaking to then? He is showing us that we must love him above all others to the point that there is, that in, in the indifference to, or in regards to, that it is God above everybody else, and it is God above everything else. But this doesn't separate me from my family. This causes me to love them that much more. This causes me to be who God is calling me to be, so that the work of God can flow through my life and my family can be a benefit or benefit or beneficiaries of the fact that I came into alignment with God that I repented of my own ways and I chose to find my identity under the guide of my heavenly father and allowed him to free me of my own sins and allowed him to free me from my own chains and allowed him to free me from my own hurts and the curses of generations that went down from one to the other but God is messing that up now he's messing that up now so your kids and your grandkids don't have to repeat and say, well, I feel like I'm already too far from that and it's far removed. Let me tell you this today. If you will sincerely repent and come back into agreement, God can do those things that seem even impossible and He can restore the years that the caterpillars and the canker worms have eaten and stolen. God is able to do extraordinary things, miraculous things. If you will continue to come into alignment with Him, so do away with that thinking of it's too late or I've missed it. And don't find yourself sticking your head in the sand and just letting shame take you under and say, oh, woe is me, for I missed it so many times. Come to Him in repentance, but let Him brush all of that off of you now. Let Him wash over you. Put on you a clean robe, a ring on your finger, and that you stand in your place as a child of God as a son of God, as a child of the King, and you know your place, and you continue to seek the Lord from there, so you don't draw back to the places where the Lord has brought you out of. Hallelujah. Amen. And so to love is indifference to those things. I love God so much. 
I love my family, but if my family takes me away from God, I, that's a place I can't go. Now, I realize that this is a message that maybe is not quite so easy to grasp in North America, but there is countries and people even within our own where when you claim the name of Jesus, you will be put out of the family. You will be removed from the family. So what do you do? You stand for Jesus. That's what you do. There's places in the world today where your life might be threatened if you claim the name of Jesus. There's countries where they'll let you claim Christianity, but when they watch you get baptized, then persecution comes. And so what if that comes to North America? Are we, are, are we such a sissified church that we've just become such wusses that as soon as a little bit of pressure is on us, we cave, collapse, and renounce, deny, and run away from the name of Jesus. No, let that not be said of us. Let it be known of us that we will claim the name of Jesus, but we will stand for the name of Jesus as persecution comes in the earth. If persecution comes from my family, I'll stand still for the name of Jesus, for I know that it is the name that is above every name, and one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But in the meantime, time let this be your continued confession that you claim and you stand for the name of Jesus that you love the Lord and that you serve the Lord that you desire to build your life and to build your family on the word of God and the truth of his word and not just by culture and so some have to stand against parents and some have to stand against children but you got to know how to take a stand I see a sad trend in North America. I can't speak for the rest of the world because I don't see it happening. But I see a sad trend that is happening amongst us in this day where those that are the elders and should know better are being led astray by the younger. And the younger imposing the culture on those who have experienced a different reality. But through guilt. You see, the enemy's conniving. He's conniving. And so they, they, they'll call you many things. But, but can you stand to be called a bigot? Can you stand to be called hateful even when that's not your position? Or what you will to be? Or what you want to be seen as? But people will call you things. Are you hearing me today? People will call you things. And I'm not telling you, I'm not trying to justify anybody in their, in, in their religious stinking attitude. Come on, someone should have shouted, shouted an amen there. I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to build anybody up that you just become that much more justified in your carnality. But I'm talking about those places where you really have to stand and it hurts to stand and you have to stand against people that you love but you still got to stand and you've got to hold the standard of truth. you got to let the light shine through you. Knowing you can't control what everybody else does around you. And if they choose to neglect you or ostracize you, that is their choice. And we've got to come back to the place where I continue to lean on Jesus. I know some of these things that I'm talking to you today, they're not easy. But I'm telling you, that it's the better way. It's God's way. Because as you align yourself with Him, you can watch what God will do. You can be torn over here and you can live a lie if you want to. But you might have to stand over here and feel some darts and feel some pressures. But if you'll stand and continue to stand and like the scripture said, having done all to stand. And then you watch God break through and tear down the lies of the accuser and the lies of the enemy and those things that have been holding your kids captive that might not have come. That victory may have never come had you not been willing to stand and plant your feet on God's truth and let the Spirit lead and direct your life. Praise God. Many people, their idea of living a spirit-led life is by living a life that is led by what they want to do. <laughs> Amen. I'm getting ready to close, so if you're getting all squirmy. Many people, their idea of living a spirit-led life is living by what they desire to do. 
But a spirit-led life is a laid-down life, a crucified life. So the things that would have been my own ungodly desires have been replaced by what is God's desire. And that has become my true desire now. I actually desire it. I desire it. Things that we struggle to let go of. And maybe there's some things right now you're struggling to let go of. But if you will give those things over to God, you will look back one day and realize you gained something so much better. You gained something so much more. And that thing that seemed like such a big sacrifice wasn't much of a sacrifice at all. So respond to the Lord today and lay down your life, amen, because we are called to be a living sacrifice. Laying down our lives and living a spirit-led life, hallelujah, a life that is laid down where we're not governed by our flesh anymore, not just living by everything that our flesh dictates to us. And so our flesh pulling us all over the place and pulling us outside of the will of God and our flesh bringing our marriage to the brink of divorce. Instead, we're crucifying, crucifying, living a spirit-led life. And where the flesh was like a taskmaster and it would rip you all around because the enemy, he tries to get his flesh hooks in us and tries to pull us over here and pull us over there. In places where he looks to bind us and restrain us and hold on to us. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And so he frees us that I might freely choose to serve the Lord and follow the leading of the Spirit in my life and where it was once the flesh who was my governor, now I live a life that is led by the Spirit. And so sometimes i got to crucify some things still and the flesh will try and pull on you and you'll feel that old man start to rise up but you got to put him back down again as he's a dead man and you're alive in Jesus. And you live a spirit-led life. And now the spirit can lead you. And the spirit can say, talk to him. And the spirit can say, can give this much. And, 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 and the spirit can say, pray about this right now. And the spirit can begin to reveal things to you about yourself and about your family. And the spirit can safeguard your life. Hallelujah. Safeguard your life. I don't know even how many times I get a prompting from the spirit. And through prayer or obedience, my life is protected from something that was trying to bring harm. But because the Spirit warned me and prompted me, my life was safeguarded because of the Spirit that was leading and the Spirit that was speaking. He leads us and guides us into all truth. The Spirit never speaks contrary to God's Word. Never leads us out of alignment with God. I tell you, if you can just get this in your heart alone today, church, it is a precious nugget, a foundational thing that you can build upon. The Spirit never goes outside God's Word. Well, my feelings, my feelings, your feelings be damned in the name of Jesus. You don't live by your feelings. That is not what you live by. And those feelings that are trying to take you outside of God God's word you've got to let those things be crucified that you would rise up in the spirit and I say that in the biblical sense those feelings are not from God those spirit those, those, those feelings will take you outside his will and they look to bring you to a place of destruction but the spirit is calling you into the path of life amen into the path of life. And sometimes there's restraints in us saying, oh, no, no, I don't want to be that religious person. Because, you see, the devil twists it all up. He does. And so sometimes where God is trying to lead you into a way of life, and all you can see is religion, all you can see is legalism, but he's trying to show you a better way, a way of life, but things get twisted up. If the, if the enemy can't get you one way, he tries another. But if we stand on the Word of God, maintain that kind of heart that is willing to lay down, that kind of heart that is soft, that can say, God, 
This is where I'm being pulled. This is what I want. But this is what I feel you saying to me. And there's times I've had to take things, put up with things. Put up with attitudes I didn't want to put up with. But the Lord said, humble yourself. Let it be. Let it be. And those aren't easy things. Maybe somebody ripped you off. And God says, let it go. I don't want to let it go. I want, to, I want to run their name down all over town. But the Lord says, let it go. <laughs> let it go. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I remember I had a roommate, and when he owed me rent or money, he would say, well, you know, the Bible says something like give and not, don't expect anything in return. <laughs> and I, I would respond, and I'd say, yeah, but the Bible also said the wicked borrows and pays not again. <laughs> Little side note today, pay people back when you owe them money. <laughs> It'll hurt relationships. It'll cause pain. Communicate. Communicate. Don't just shut the phone off. <laughs> Why am I talking about this, Lord? Don't just shut the phone off. <laughs> At least communicate. At least communicate. At least talk. Because the enemy looks for so many ways to find inroads into our life, to tear us down. But God wants to bless us, and He wants His blessings to flow in our lives and over our families and over our homes. Hallelujah. Where He can enrich your life. Enrich your life. Now, I want to just add a little bit of caution as I teach this final part, but I, I'm closing right now. That as we talk about God enriching our life, we, we, we hold on to this and recognize it's not all about us. It's not all about what I get out of it. Let's not take that kind of heart. But as I said last week, and I know that this is a truth, that the things that God calls us to give are not without reward. And when He calls us to sow, we need to be mindful that it equals in harvest. Not just in this life, but also in the next. You see, this kind of understanding takes spirit. It takes faith. It takes trust. And so this is why the natural man, he would struggle with it. And where God is calling us to lay that down because it is in that area where we might not see yet or maybe what I can't receive right now, but it's there. And so as you learn to trust God in these areas of your life and walk with Him in obedience, He takes you to the rewards. He takes you to the places of blessing. He can lift you up in positions that you're not qualified to be in, that you don't have the right education for, but God can cause you to be blessed, and God can cause you to abound regardless of these many things. It is the work of of God and I'm telling you he can give you new ideas he, he can bring things into your life that seem to come out of nowhere but it came out of the spirit realm and it is the blessing of God where he wants to bring increase into your life and even in places where we've had to stand strong and feel the blunt of people's rejection as we are disregarded as we are cast away it is not without reward. For he said that we would have reward not only in this life, but also in the next. And so sometimes you have to stand up even in your own house and serve the Lord. But keep serving the Lord. And don't let God, number one, ever be removed from your heart. Continue to live. Continue to grow into Jesus first living. Jesus first living. Ask God to teach you what it looks like. Ask God to show you what it means. But continue to keep a heart that wants Him to be number one in your life. That you would have that same desire that we read about in Matthew 6. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Well, I got at least 30 more minutes of material I could get into, but I won't. <laughs> I won't. Would you stand with me today? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
I hope that, that something's speaking to you today. I hope that you can receive it in the spirit of meekness so that you can hear what the Lord says. Because I'm telling you, the enemy, he tries to twist so many things up and he'll say, oh, that preacher, he's just trying to get at you and he's just trying to get this from you. And he already knew about that. Let me tell you, so many of the things I say on Sunday, I don't plan to say. I don't plan to say. <laughs> but God knows how to get his word to where we need to hear it. So I pray over you today, have an ear to hear the things that the Lord would say. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew in us a right spirit, O Lord. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew in us a right spirit, O Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, thank you, Father, that you continue to cause our hearts to come to the place where we are willing to be the sacrifices that are living a laid-down life because it is through the laid-down life where we will experience the glory of God and we will experience revival and we will experience the power of God being made manifest in our life and we will experience the increase of God's kingdom. We will experience the increase that only God is able to bring into our lives as we learn to lay our lives down, walk with you, trust you, and follow your direction and follow your lead. So sweet Spirit of the Lord, would you guide our hearts? Would you direct our minds? Would you speak to us, O oh Lord, those things that you would say would you give us ears to hear Lord would you give us ears to hear those things that you would speak to me not just what you're saying to everybody God but I want to know what are you saying to me what are you saying to me because this relationship is personal and what does he say to you to you take that hear his voice run with what God says Run with what God says. Hallelujah. He wants to bring a sense of direction in your life. Glory to God. A sense of direction in your life where you know you are moving towards God. You are moving towards God. And that, 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 that might just sound like such an easy thing to say, but it encompasses so much. It encompasses so much when you realize what it means when your life is moving towards God. And as you're moving towards God, so is your family. You don't realize sometimes the things that is God is doing through your simple obedience through your simple obedience you don't understand sometimes how much God is doing just because you came to church that's why I tell people just keep coming just keep coming just don't stop coming because you know just like I know the enemy will try and get in there some way to mess that up keep coming and growth happens where you don't even realize that it's taking place thank you father